Hello and welcome to Beyond Organic Wine. I'm Adam Huss coming to you from crazy hot California. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this podcast, please take a quick minute to subscribe or leave a great review or both. It's a huge help and you can do it without spending a dime or even a full minute. Thank you. Some really big moments have happened in my wine life in the last few weeks that have honestly rocked me a bit. Some of them in a good way. Like attending the recent workshop with Christine Jones here at Piscinus Ranch two weeks ago. So much of what we think we know about growing plants is wrong, and it's so much simpler than we think it is, and in some cases it's just completely opposite what we think it is. We think we need legumes for nitrogen, and this is mostly wrong. We apply lots of fungicides but refuse to till when the damage done by shallow tillage is actually less than the, that done by the fungicides we apply regularly. We think soil tests enable us to understand our soil. They mostly don't. We think applying soil nutrients like composts and manures is the way to make up for deficiencies, while it is actually training our crops to be dependent. We think weeding and eliminating competition is the key to a productive cash crop, when a polyculture produces more and more consistently. We think carbon is the problem, and we need to sequester all the excess carbon to heal climate change, but Water vapor is actually the problem, and we need to heal the water cycle to roll back climate change. And if you don't believe any of this and think I'm nuts, check out the work of Christine Jones first. And then second, go plant a diversity of plants, because as you'll find out, a diversity of plants is the solution to plant health, soil health, water cycles, carbon sequestration, and our own health and survival. Think about this. In addition to a DNA blueprint to become an organism that can turn sunlight into sugar. Your average tiny plant seed, think of a sunflower seed or a grape seed, contains nine billion microbes. The first thing a seed does is grow a root. And with that root, it inoculates the soil around it with those nine billion microbes. The problem is that we see plants and soil as separate things when the reality is that they are a single living system that cycles sunlight into life then recycles all that through what we call death. So that's Christine Jones, liberally paraphrased. Please go learn from her. She retired after the workshop she gave here, so you'll have to rely on recordings, but there are some good ones out there. Other things have me asking some fundamental questions of regenerative viticulture and regen ag in general. The questions have arisen from some on-the-ground realities here in California viticulture that I don't think it's spoken of openly or honestly enough among those of us working in regenerative viticulture. I'm not fully ready to speak about these ideas yet since I'm, I'm still in the thick of it, but it's coming. <laughs> but it has made me realize that I, f- I feel like there's a need for me to clarify my vision for wine, if you'll give me a minute, because I do so much time asking questions and interviewing people that I don't think I ever really say what I believe, so to speak, and or just what I feel like I've discovered. Maybe it's not a belief. I try not to believe anything, but I feel like I've, I'm discovering some things, and, and I have they've informed my vision. And so one thing that I think is being revealed to me is that if we don't build a wine system ecologically, using regenerative practices may be ineffective and even detrimental to our farming. I don't think anyone should plant grapes where they live just because you love wine. And I don't think you should plant Vitus vinifera, the European species of grape, everywhere you plant grapes. Let me make this more concrete. I think many, many vineyards around the world, whether farmed organically or beyond organically or not, should not exist. If you happen to have access to land in an arid part of this world, for God's sakes, don't plant grapes. Plant cacti, plant agave, plant a puncha, plant mesquite, and many others. Make the best freaking fermentations from these plants that the world has ever tasted. Build a tradition out of making and drinking it that aligns with the seasons where you live. Build a culture around those traditions, around what grows well where you are without any human intervention. If you look around you and don't see grapes, don't plant them. If you see grapes but they aren't vinifera, don't plant vinifera. Work with what's already there, thriving. We don't need any more grape wine or vinifera grape wine. Grapes aren't somehow superior to other kinds of fruits. They don't have some magical ability to translate terroir. Terroir is culture. Culture is geography. 
You can express the culture of your place best by using what your land does well without inputs from you. I call this ecological winemaking, but you can call it whatever you want. The point is if you start and build your culture, and culture here is both a fermentation and a human tradition around something that the land isn't already doing, you're going to have lots of problems. You're going to have to expend enormous amounts of energy and resources to make something that is essentially a flourish. And by flourish, I mean an extra gesture of unnecessary beauty. Wine is the grace note, the cherry on top, the serif, the foil capsule and the bottle of life. So why, first of all, would we want to waste precious resources on it unnecessarily for the sake of our egos as the world burns? And secondly, why would we not want to spend the time to grow a culture that is special, unique, impossible to imitate because it grows from conditions that don't exist anywhere else in the universe? It's so freaking easy to make another fill-in-the-blank wine from fill-in-the-blank grapes. It's not interesting to me to taste another fill-in-the-blank, let alone make it. Organic fill-in-the-blank isn't enough. Organic is just conventional with different sprays. Even regenerative works within the same paradigm if you don't start ecologically. I envision something that is different from the ground up. The difficulty of communicating this is that we see the world through human-centric eyes. We see the land as property, which is a term that makes the land subservient to us. The truth is, as our ancestors have taught us, that we are the land's children. We aren't its stewards. We are plants that grow from the soil by the grace of the sun and the rain. What I don't think most people consider is that even if the use of fossil fuels didn't have negative environmental impacts, it would still be cheating. Look around you, wherever you are right now, unless you happen to be hiking in old growth forest or a preserved UNESCO World Heritage Site or maybe adrift on a log raft in the ocean, I'd bet that most of what you see didn't exist a hundred years ago, just a hundred years ago, and probably nothing that you see around you would be there. And most of it couldn't have existed without fossil fuels. Think about the trellising posts, wires, irrigation lines in our vineyards. Think of the paved roads and the vehicles that we drive on them. Think of our towering cities of skyscrapers made of steel and glass. Think of the metaphoric and now literal ocean of plastic that we swim in every day. It's all very, very young relative to the earth. Like an eruption, we exploded with creative energy fueled by burning the last hours of ancient sunlight, trapped through photosynthetic plants and plankton, and transformed through time into carbon-rich energy stores that we use to make and transport and terraform literally everything. One calculation is that it took 98 tons of biomass to produce every gallon of gasoline that we burn. That's about and the entire grape harvest from 33 acres of Napa Vineyard land or the average harvest from 65 acres of wheat. And we know, even though we don't let ourselves think about it when we commute to work, that those stores of energy are finite. In another hundred years, just another hundred, it's likely we will have burned it all up, or at least enough of it that it will be so scarce that only the very rich and powerful will have it and will hoard it for themselves. In a global sense, we already do. Maybe it won't be 100 years, maybe it will be 200, maybe it will be 50. The point is that in a very short time, relatively speaking, this entire way of life will be impossible. It will be gone. In a global sense, it won't even be a blip on the timeline. It was only 100 years ago that the first airplane successfully flew across North American continent. In another 100 years, will any of us even be able to afford air travel? And please don't think that technology will save us, that solar will save us, that electric cars will save us. The hardware of every technology gets mined from the earth with hardware and transported with hardware and built with hardware that all comes from mining the earth. And they all degrade and must be replaced regularly with new hardware. My point is that we take for granted things that should not be taken for granted. We feel entitled to things that will disappear like our breath vapors on a cold morning. We build our dreams, our lives, our survival on fragile ideas that are younger than some of our grandparents. We go to a piece of land and don't ask how we can farm and live within the limits of that land because most of us making decisions about land now have never known a world where those limits mattered. We can grow grapes here because 
We can use a fossil-fueled industrial system to dig deep wells with heavy machinery and lay miles of pipe and irrigation line of steel and plastics and erect deer fences and trellises of extruded metal and shaped wood. And we grow things that don't actually live here because we mine more water than falls from the sky. We can drive for hours to buy grapes and other fruit, and we can easily make many gallons of wine and ship it around the globe very quickly and cheaply. We don't have to be near enough to our markets to carry it by the ordinary energies of flowing water or horses or winds in sails. We could use these things. Wine styles globally have actually evolved because of the limits of a world that didn't use fossil fuel exploiting technologies. But then we commodified those wines and replicated them everywhere around the world and forgot to build within our own local limits because it was so easy to cheat. So as an exercise, I think it's incredibly valuable to imagine, especially if you're someone who gets to make decisions about a part of this world, how you'd build a wine culture without fossil fuels from only what is right around you to share with only those who you can reach without fossil fuels. We may not be able to achieve this entirely right now, but it will begin to reveal to us the steep hill that we have to climb back up very soon. For my part, I'm trying to take as many steps as I can to be heading up that hill rather than careening out of control even further down. The only energy systems that regenerate are biological systems. The only salvation is aligning with and living within the limits of the biological systems that have been in place for millions of years. The good news is that we're one of the organisms of that diverse ancient biological system. The bad news, which really isn't bad news when we take our egos out of the equation, is that death is an integral part of the biological system that is our only hope. So that's my vision for wine. Study the land where you live closely, then plant a diversity of plants that want to be there. Then make wine as if you've never heard of gasoline. Then flow into death like a raindrop into a stream, into a river, into an ocean, into a raindrop. Now, I'm really excited to share a conversation I had with Ariana Ross, a certified sommelier and the author of the book, Wine's Way to Art, a treatise on wine as art and why art is something we need to be human. It's such a pleasure to talk with Ariana because she has the unusual ability to entertain ideas and argue a perspective without getting her ego involved. Conversation is a tool that she uses to hone her own thinking and to move further down the path in the pursuit of truth. Because of that, I could talk to her for hours. So this discussion feels to me like just the beginning of something much bigger. We delve into some pretty juicy topics, though, including elitism in wine, how to separate that idea from expertise and acquired tastes and reverence, as well as questioning the idea of higher pleasures. We also look at whether it's appropriate to refer to wine as art and what it means for wine to be approached as an art. Among many questions discussed and unanswered, we discussed the importance of the canon of wine, one end, not two, as in the prime examples and archetypes, and whether a canon exists for other types of wine besides the commonly understood European grape wine. We don't always agree, and that's the fun of it. Ariana allowed us to explore these perennially important ideas through her book, which seems extremely timely, and the result was a dynamic and candid exchange that has left me looking forward to the next conversation. Please go to who is Ariana, that's A R I A N A, one N, dot com, who is Ariana dot com, and buy her book. It's short and it's scintillating. And I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Ariana, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Thank you so and, much. Yeah, I'm glad to be having this conversation with you. And I wish that. Well, I, I will give you a little introduction to say that you wrote a very intriguing, thought-provoking, and wonderful little book called Wine's Way to Art that, you know, I want to talk to you about some of the ideas in that. But could you introduce yourself, you know, your name and just sort of like how you got to writing that book and, you know, what, what, why? <laughs> what, what was that all about? <laughs> why would you ever do such a thing? <laughs> um, sure. So my name is Ariana Ross and, um, I am a certified sommelier. I guess I'll start there. Um, right, right yeah. out of college. I started, I started working in the wine industry, um, before I was old enough to drink wine. And 
Um, I worked in the wine industry for about seven or eight years, and um, you mean before did you a bunch of different drink things. Wine I... legally, legally, legally. That is true. I mean, yes, that's never too young um, to drink wine. <laughs> I'll let I'll let that. Yeah, I'll let you handle that in a different podcast. <laughs> <Go. laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry, but yeah, I was working in restaurants while I was going to college, and um, got turned onto wine as a lot of people do by working in the restaurant in the restaurant industry and then um i worked a harvest um was i was at a kind of a point in my life where i was really hungry for something to dive into and i was like really you know i was 20 and i was like looking for meaning and and i found this thing that that combined so many different facets of the world into one thing it was culture it was geology it was history it's art it's so many different things and i just totally fell in love with it so i um i worked a harvest and saw that side of it which is crazy and um and then worked this is kind of a long story about my background i hope you don't mind um worked no. as uh in a wine shop for a while and then did the sommelier certification and then i was a buyer for another wine shop for a little while and uh, and then I got into distribution and worked in that for a few years. And then and then I left the industry around the time of the pandemic. Um, I worked another few harvests in there as well. But um, I wanted to get out of the industry and do a few other things, which is a long story. We could get into later if you want. Um, but now mm-hmm. I'm predominantly a writer. Um, so uh, for myself, I do a lot of creative nonfiction. So I did, I did this little book, which is... Um, my goal is to make it a series. Um, this is the first one, and then essays and poetry. And then for clients, I do ghostwriting and copywriting and editing and things like that. And how I That's came true. to write the book, right? That was a question too. Um, <laughs> yeah, how I came to write the book was it's um, I I've always loved talking about wine. Um, when I was in the the industry, I. I led a lot of tastings and classes and I, for those like seven or eight years, I basically talked to people about wine all day, every day <laughs> as my job in my life and um, talked to people on many different levels. So I was talking to consumers, of course, people who had come into wine shops and needed to know what to buy. Um, and I was also talking to buyers as a distributor, I was talking to importers, other distributors, winemakers. So everyone is just talking about wine all the time. And I found that so many people are so bad at talking about wine. I was kind of (laughs) blown away by that (laughs) Um, for a lot of reasons. I think there's a lot of really good, interesting reasons why that's the case. But, um, But yeah, I found that a lot of people, you know, it's a very complex system, wine, it combines a lot of different things and it's easy to get lost in the weeds talking about it. Um, it's also, it you know, it's predominantly smell and taste. And I don't think we have a lot of language for those senses, interestingly enough. And there are also senses that are very subjective and very associative and very emotional. Um, Proust, of course, is a great example of all of that. Um and then there's all of these class associations with wine and then there's this gatekeeping people talking really fancy on purpose and then people are like fighting against the gatekeeping by trying to reduce wine to something that's just you know not fancy and then i think you lose a lot in that so anyway i think like in this like labyrinth of factors i just found that a lot of people weren't really good at talking about wine especially to people who didn't know much about it um, and I really loved doing that when I was in the industry. And I found that I could talk to people in a way that could let could bring them into the industry in a way that felt approachable and fun while not losing the magic of it all. So I wanted to write um, to write a little series, like introducing people to wine um, across different topics, like one little book at a time um, in a way that felt really approachable and taking a kind of like third avenue of um of trying to represent the magic of wine without getting lost in the weeds and kind of conveying a lot of insights um without just giving people a ton of information to memorize and maps and facts and all of that stuff 
So yeah, that's a little bit about why I did the I, book. I um, have a couple follow-up questions for you. Can you talk to me as if I don't know anything about wine? <laughs> is that putting you sure. too much on the spot? Or, or I mean, I, what I'm really asking for is for you to describe, you know, like how you would talk to, like how are you good at it and how are other people, how do other people sort of fail at, at in talking mm. to people that you know are learning that are at the beginning okay oh man i really set myself up for this didn't i <laughs> um you know it's probably i mean like it's not fair telling... because i'm sure nobody just comes to you and is like i don't know anything about wine can you talk to me as if i don't know anything right. i'm sure people come to you with questions <laughs> and that identifies like what level of you know knowledge they're at and then you take it from right. there you probably respond and react to them so, sorry i gave you like a totally hypothetical and unfair situation to deal with but no you, i mean it's, it's okay. maybe you can be very general about it. you don't actually have to <laughs> pretend or anything but... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or or what I are the what issues I'm... that people have? Yeah. Or oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I noticed is and I've noticed this in other industries too cuz I've worked outside of wine as well. I've dabbled in a bunch of other things. And I've found in general that it seems like a lot of people when they get into an industry or a field of knowledge and they're in it for some amount of time, I mean, it can be a very small amount of time surprisingly. And they gain some knowledge and some just um, like grounding and perspective within that industry, then it's really easy for them to lose touch with what it's like to not be in that industry and what it's like to not have mm -hmm. any of that knowledge. Yeah. Um, so you kind of immediately lose perspective of anyone who's not yourself, essentially. Um, yeah. I, and. I yeah, I found. Have you noticed that too? Yeah, no. I mean, I, I I had this realization one day of how confusing wine was. Well, please finish your thought. I can come back to it. Okay. Um. And yeah, I I think just remaining grounded in the outside world and maintaining mm -hmm. some like empathy and reminding yourself that um of who the person in front of you is and really like. You know, a lot of people come into any situation with just like they are the hammer and everything is the nail, you know, mm. <laughs> and um, and in this totally uh, what is the word like solipsistic, like in this way that they like forget that that they are not the center of the universe, essentially. And I think really just maintaining like some grounding and empathy with where the other person is coming from and what they know and then just meeting them where they're at i think yeah. is really the yeah the trick it's yeah well i i mean i had this realization i walked into my grocery store wine aisle one day and i was just like why would what would anybody do with this aisle who didn't have the knowledge that i had it would be oh my god it would be like it would be like walking into a french bookstore like can't read the titles no idea what this is i'm just gonna yeah, walk past right. like i have no interest in engaging with this it's like a giant wall in a different language of just everything looks basically identical you know like great there's some bottle mm -hmm. variation and label color variation but you know it's literally a different language in many cases <laughs> and and then figuratively yeah. a different language in nearly every case and if you literally don't know anything about wine, you know, like you just, somebody was like, oh, you should, your, your doctor is like, you know, red wine, a glass of red wine might be good for you, you know? And you go in to yeah. do that. Like, <laughs> just be like, mm, no clue. Yeah. Like I, I we just run yeah. screaming for the aisle. Really, really. Like it's, it's totally repulsive to anybody without like, I mean, it takes a significant level of knowledge just to be able to interpret like a, uh, an aisle of wine at a grocery store. Um, totally. And really added to that, and added to that, there's such high stakes associated with it. Right. Because right. there are so, because it's this thing that is supposed to, you know, tell the world about who you are and like your class. And you know what I mean? All of that. Yeah. Um, like there's, there's so many, you know, like, I don't know, wine influencers and stuff like that, that are just like trying to give people a, uh, um, like some grounding. It's like okay, when you when you meet your girlfriend's parents, you want to impress them, or you know, like that kind of stuff. And like a lot of that holds up in our culture. It's really high stakes. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's true. Well, I I want to, you know, I I as after reading this, I had some some bigger questions for you that I, you know, wanted to challenge I mean, partly because the the few conversations that we've had have been fantastic and thought-provoking and wanted to have more of those. But before that, like I I mean, I just wonder if you could sort of if if you could describe what the book is about generally. Um if we can yeah, sort of talk about yeah, the topics that you cover. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I haven't read it in a while, so let me refresh my memory here. <laughs> well, I love the, the <laughs> I can give you the chapter titles. <laughs> oh, no, um, I remember. I remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, okay, so the it's kind of, it's interesting because as I was writing it, I I had so many different ideas about what it was going to be when I started it. And I was, basically, it was this very ambitious thing of like, I'm going to cover everything that everyone needs to know about wine. Actually, my in, uh, initial first title idea was everything you need to know about wine. And I started to get into that. And I was like, man, this is a lot of information. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if I can do this. So I decided to instead split it up into a series. So, and in each one, just take one topic and just approach it in a way that's super focused and very specific to that one little topic. So the first one is actually not very informative about wine itself at all. Um, it's much more of a almost like a philosophical treatise um, on on wine, arguing that wine is art, and then saying, okay, if wine is art, then what is art? So I attempt to define art, um, and then talk about wine as being a higher pleasure and talk about what is a higher pleasure and why it's laden with a bunch of um, kind of complicated political things. And, and, but I really, I think the book is really arguing that there is a tremendous value of in art for art in our lives and, um, and really just um, investing in things that in investing in pleasures that pay back and and really just like paying attention to the world around us um and i explore those ideas through through wine and through the idea that wine is is art um so yeah that's that's my synopsis <laughs> do you think i uh do you think i hit it there it's yeah it's kind of um i don't know when i finished it i was like what is this like i like it but i don't know what it is <laughs> yeah no it's i mean it, it's like if this was the first book in a like i don't i know nothing about wine and i'm and i want to learn and you're like here read this yeah it, it would be mind-blowing in some respects you know what i mean like it's it's definitely like yeah. um, jumping right into the deep end but in a good way like not like like instead of like i think it can get really confusing to be like oh and I mean, this is really a question for you, but like, you know, when, if you need to know something about wine, well, shoot, where do I start? Um, let's, let's start in France and bottle shapes and grape names. And then pretty soon you have like this epic body of knowledge that there's just no way to communicate yeah. clearly and concisely to anybody. And you've left them more confused than you started with, but starting with like a big yeah. idea about seeing wine through the lens of art and how that impacts like your enjoyment of it your experience of it and the cultural elements of it i think is a really fun great way to do it i mean and and so if i was going to ask you a question about that it would be is that your i mean if the if you were you know if you were going to boil down what's important to convey to somebody who's just learning about mm -hmm. wine does this book do that do you think like is that the approach that you would take is there some other way that you would like you know an elevator pitch kind of if, <laughs> I, I'm guessing you're familiar with that term, but like, um, you know, like yeah, a 30 yeah. second, like, oh, you don't know anything about wine? Well, how, like, what, like, what is the essential information mm. that somebody needs to know to get intrigued enough to want to learn more kind of, and, and is this Yeah, that's to do a cool that? question. I think so. Yeah. I mean, okay. my idea was like, if this is, this will be a series so that this one is the attempt to level set the series and say, this is what we're talking about. This is not what we're talking about. Right. Um, and it's, it, it really addresses a lot of kind of meta questions about the industry and about wine 
and saying like, this is an industry that is riddled with gatekeepers and there's so much snobbery and elitism. And I have chapters that just talk about, you know, snobbery and elitism and things like that. And, um, and my attempt with the book is, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Your attempt with the book is please finish. My attempt with the book is, is to, is to like level set the whole, process of learning about wine to see like okay you're gonna get on board with the series and the next ones the next wine the the next books are actually gonna dive into topics about wine um so like this is you know whatever i'll we'll talk about those later but um (laughs) right right the but the but the the idea with this book was like before we get into the actual knowledge and information um you should be going into a study of wine, not because you want to be fancy or seem fancy or because you want to alienate other people with the knowledge that you have, or you want to impress others. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing is we are stepping into the, into an appreciation for a form of art. And we're doing that with a great deal of humility and reverence and a desire to appreciate the magic of the world and not to gain a bunch of knowledge and alienate other people with all this new information that we have. So yeah, I think to answer your question, I think that this is the elevator pitch that I would give. So something you already brought up and you definitely talked about um, a couple of these concepts, these two concepts that I was really intrigued by in your book. One I'm intrigued by it because I like to talk about it and think about it in relation to wine and the other, because I think it's such an important idea that you brought up. So I'm going to start with that one first, which is elitism. And you brought up this idea that elitism does not equal education, expertise, and experience. If I can put it that way, you know, that there's, we need to make that distinction between, you know, somebody who has education, you know, and I think a way to do that, I think you, I mean, I think the way that you do this is pointing out that, you know, elitism is saying that some people are more valuable than others and versus some ideas are more valuable and I, you know, than others. Um, yeah. And, and any people can have some of those ideas, but especially people who might've studied for a very long time or had a lot of experience with something might have better ideas about that thing than other people that doesn't make them more valuable people but it does give their ideas something some worth and some worth listening to and paying attention to and and respecting is that a fair characterization of of that idea and and feel free to say whatever you want to say about elitism yeah that's a very fair characterization i i that was a lot of that chapter was me pushing back on a trend that I have seen over the last decade build, which is people, um, society really turning against um, elitism. And I, okay, yeah. elitism is is the is too broad of a term. There, it's it's society kind of pushing. It's really like getting. I mean, I think it it really parallels like Trump rising to power. You know, yeah. I think there's a. I, I don't know how political you want to get in this, but like. <laughs> I, and I'm not even like, you know, this is just from like a, a systems agnostic systems view. But I think there is this upswell of people being frustrated by what feels like the old guard kind of, I don't even know if it's the old guard, but it's like exactly what you said. It's like people who have education or experience, um, there's almost like this, like a, it seems like society is valuing them more than other people and other people are feeling maybe like pushed out into the margins or disrespected or devalued or something like that. And I think as a response, it seems like there's this, you know, pushback against um, education and against experience and against things like that. And um, more of this like democratization of value, which it's so complicated because I support that, right? Like that's a really positive thing. And, um, but I think it's tricky. I think often with these broad social movements, um, the core of the movement is really good and really has a lot of like valuable criticism. And then 
it gains momentum and it builds into a mass movement. And then all of a sudden it's pretty bastardized and diluted and other people are attaching, you know, these kind of like lesser versions of that initial concept to it. So, so I think there's a lot of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater of saying that like, okay, yeah, we don't want elitism, but we do, we do want to respect exactly what you said. Like we do want to respect that if someone dedicated 30 years of their life to a, to the study of a certain subject, they might have a different opinion <laughs> or they might have a different thing to say about this. And that's worth paying attention to. I'm not saying that it's everything, but it's worth, it's worth listening yeah. to. There is value to that. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they can't be wrong about that subject in some ways, you know, but it also doesn't mean that they automatically are wrong just because they are yeah. experienced. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, you could also, you could very easily argue that if someone has, you know, 30 years of study in this one field, then they have been, I'm thinking about like academia right now, then like they have had like 30 years of indoctrination, you know what I mean? <laughs> and yes, um, yes. And I think yeah, that that, point. And that's, that can be true. I think this is the complicated thing about this stuff is like everything is super nuanced and complicated. And as soon as we start to try and like paint these really broad strokes, we lose all of the truth. Cause I think most of the truth and everything lies in the nuance and in the little gray areas, um, which is not, which is not conducive to mass movements. Um, and right. like broad zeitgeist shifts, which, um, which is, you know, what, what this is. Um, right. but yeah, I think, you know, if, if we can, um, like if we have the like mental and emotional processing power to be able to take everything as its own isolated situation, um, and not just paint broad strokes based on, um, you know, where they fall where this person falls like demographically or experience wise or whatever, then I think we're going to, if we're able to take things more on a case by case basis and really just like remain open and look at something for what it is, then um, that's, that's better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you brought up and characterized those various things very well. I'm curious how you see this in wine, of course. Mm -hmm. How I see elitism in wine? Yeah, or, or, and how those things play out in terms of the the idea that there are people who, you know, are whatever, certified sommeliers or have a diploma from WSET, and yet <laughs> I'm, I'm exactly the kind of person who would come in and be like, I would point to that as something that like, have you ever questioned the idea of like what the foundation of all of that education is based on the assumptions that all of that education mm -hmm. are based upon. And if those are valid assumptions in the first place sure. and, you know, and I would argue to a certain degree, they are not. And in a big way, in ways that a lot of people are really afraid to talk about, or because it threatens, you know, their livelihood, it threatens like an entire system and industry and economic structure of, of wine. And yeah. so, yeah, I don't know. I, this is my perspective on that, but uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, this is where I, I guess I'm sensitive to this idea of elitism in wine too. And this, and the idea of, oh, what was your chapter title about um, a higher pleasure, you know, like looking at wine as a higher pleasure, you know, mm -hmm. sort of this idea that you can have, you can you can acquire a taste for certain things throughout your life. And we all yeah. do, like all of our tastes change. I mean, maybe not all of us, but many of us, our tastes change throughout our lives. And we acquire new things that maybe we hated as a child and now we love them. And vice versa, you know, we might have loved candy as a child. Now it's, you know, like this is me. I don't, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm sensitive to that in wine in terms of like the judgments that are often associated with people's entry level palate being uneducated or less valid or less important or less, you know, just sort of something to something to get over versus something that they could just retain and enjoy for the rest of their life. 
you know, like that, whatever those right. preferences are. Um, and I can get specific about that, but if you have any thoughts, just generally, I'd love to hear them. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> um, yeah. I. So one thing in talking about the higher pleasures thing, because that is a, a chapter in this, I I was really careful to try to separate what this idea of like a higher and a lower pleasure from any um from any amount of uh like class like social associations um so my conclusion with that spoiler alert is that um it's a lot more about um how you're approaching something than what it is you're approaching and um but then but that there is but that there are certain certain things that seem to pay dividends when you invest in them and certain things that don't pay as much dividends when you invest in them so my idea with the higher pleasures thing is a big part of what makes something a higher pleasure in my book is um is that um it gets better the more you invest in it and that's something like uh, with wine, right. the more the more that you learn about wine, and this is my experience, um, the more that you learn about wine, the the more there is to enjoy because you get the taste stuff that you could if you just had a glass of wine at a wine bar knowing nothing. But then you also get all this other stuff. You you kind of un, you start to know the producers and then you start to know that, you know, Sancerre tends to taste like this and it's made like in this way and then you taste one sense air and it's slightly different from another one and then you can kind of you can compare them and you can you can start to kind of like see the riff off of this main the main baseline and anyway whatever i can get into that more but um my general idea was there are some things in the world that seem to get better and pay more dividends the more you invest in them um and um yeah i find that wine does that more than something like ice cream <laughs> um but who knows i don't know maybe there's like ice cream connoisseurs and there's a whole whole world there um but that's one thing oh, i wanted to really are, separate are, the higher me. and lower pleasures from any like associations with um something being expensive or classist or any of that stuff um but yeah about the elitism within wine i don't think there's anything better about i don't know i mean this whole like where do we get this concept of like what's better or worse but like i don't think there's anything better about knowing a bunch of stuff about wine than drinking a glass of wine and knowing nothing about it i don't think there's anything better it's just like do you want to know about wine or not and it there's and doesn't make you mm. a better or more interesting person it's like just purely a personal choice but if you do want to know more about wine then maybe you should read these you know read these books but like there's no value judgment or moral component of this whatsoever i think that that's where things get really tricky is i think that there's this thing wine it's out there you can drink it you don't have to you can learn about it. You don't have to. It doesn't matter. But if you, but like there is stuff to know about it. If you want to read about it, there's stuff out there to know. In no way does any of that make you, however you engage with that stuff, doesn't make you more or less legitimate or interesting or cool or fancy or any of that stuff. So that's kind of, I think that's the interesting weird thing where like these kind of antiquated class associations then trickle down into um really tainting a whole a whole like branch of study i don't think there's anything moralistic about this stuff um so yeah if you want to walk into a wine bar knowing absolutely nothing and drink something and it tastes good fantastic good for you and if you want to know about it read about it have fun stop wherever you want to stop that's fine too uh, does that answer any kind of <laughs> question it, it it does and it i don't know i'm beginning to kind of think that it also helps me understand myself in a way the way that you've described yeah. that in the sense that i think my own path in wine has been i i saw it as that thing that i could dig into 
you know, once I started, yeah, I mean, I just picked up a book for various reasons <laughs> um, mm -hmm. about wine that I wanted to learn more. And I felt like I needed to learn more at that time in my life. And, and then I sort of got really intrigued because I was like, wow, like I, I'm beginning to see all these connections and I'm seeing this depth and this cultural element to this and this artistic element to it. And, and so, yes, it led me deeper, but that as I, you know, kept going and going and going it's now taken me to this point where i really feel like it's revealed to me you can do that with just about anything like once you start down yeah. that rabbit hole like it sort of reveals how we're all connected and the the historic and, and cultural connections that are deeply behind everything that is just a surface element of life you know that we're actually all operating on this much deeper level we're all <laughs> you know we're yeah if that makes sense. And, and so I, you know, maybe that's feels like it's democratized wine a little bit more for me, or maybe it's just made everything a little more magic for me. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, I'm, none of that is to say I disagree at all. I, I guess it's a question of, is wine actually special in that way? Or, or is it just like, for whatever reason, we've imbued it with specialness, but and if that's a great gateway for you, great. But if not, there's lots of things that could be that for you. I don't know. What, what are you, do you have any thoughts about that? Like, is it actually special? Oh, man. I have. I mean, we're biased, asking... obviously. <laughs> right. Because we've chosen to invest. So right. that, I mean, sunk cost bias. You know what I mean? Like, there's, exactly. There, like, we're right. biased in so many ways. Like, just. Um, yeah, but I mean, that is something exactly that I've thought about for like literally the last decade of like, is there something special in this? And, um, what I have arrived at is, is yeah, but I don't know, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. I think yes. I think yes. But I think I'm also at this point. I won't like hold you little... to it. You can just take a really strong stance <laughs> and argue for it, but I will totally let you change your mind if you need to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I, I, I still do. And I have in the past very much gotten, it's easy for me to really get lost in these philosophic, philosophical labyrinths where there's like, no right answer and no way out you know what i mean and it's just you're just like in this kind of um just yeah like i i can talk myself in and out of any position very easily um and with the wine thing it's really hard to tell i mean i think like within the wine industry there's so much debate and controversy about this you know there's all this debate and controversy of like if you were to blind taste someone on a white wine and dye it with red food coloring, like, you know, a lot of people say that people will think it's a red wine, like even master sommeliers will think it's a red wine and da da da. And so kind of like little small, you know, experiments like that will kind of like just de take the legs out from like so much of the idea that this is legitimate or special, but I don't know. I don't really believe that. I cannot even imagine getting bored of white wine and thinking it's a red wine. I don't know. It'd be maybe a fun well, so experiment, but yeah. It, it's, if, I mean, so that experiment has been done multiple times with that effect where people, I mean, maybe it's in the context. I mean, obviously some deception is involved where you're leading people yeah. in one direction. And so to a certain extent, it it's obviously, you know, more of a, a psychological experiment than a wine experiment but but it does work and it's been shown multiple times to work <laughs> yeah and with with people who are professional wine tasters so it's you know there is i don't know that that is necessarily eliminates the specialness of wine i think it might eliminate that uh objectivity of, of evaluation of wine you know where you, you have these perceived experts in taste who totally misidentify a wine in its most basic sense like it's not even right you know the like of the same grapes and colors that you think it's made of 
um, by your, you know, by the sensory perceptions yeah. that you rely on for your job, you know, as an evaluator score or whatever it is like. Um, so, but does, I don't know that that's where the specialness of wine re- resides anyway. So I don't know how important that is to that. I just think it's, I think it's actually really important to just eliminate that sense of objectivity in our sensual perceptions of wine. But, um, but, but please feel free to differ. Yeah, I think the objectivity is a really important question in this. I don't think you can take that out of it. Because when I was trying to answer that yes. question, I was really thinking about it in terms of objectivity. Like, is something, is this objectively special? You know, that's a different question than is this special in my life? Mm. Whatever, it can be special in my life, but that's not worth having a right. podcast about. But <laughs> having, uh, you know, yeah, is, it this, have an inherent... is wine some. Yeah. Yes. Does it have inherent value? Does it have inherent complexity and depth and artistry that something else doesn't? That yeah, I've asked myself that in different ways for a decade. Um, and I I do think yes. I do think yes. Like I I'm a pretty harsh critic of things. Like I not necessarily of external things, but of my own perception. I'm a very harsh critic of my own perception, which. Um, in that, like, I can, I really, like, apply the scientific method to myself very rigorously and, like, really question my, um, my own opinions. Um, and I've torn this one apart. And um, I have just found that for me, it's tough because it, this always is going to get back to something subjective. But for me, um, wine has done stuff to me like wine has certain wines have made me emotional and certain wines don't and um and there's like certain wines can really take me places um and there and i believe that i believe there's something to that i don't exactly know what and i don't think that it is perfectly correlated to perceived value or price or anything like that um but but i i've no, i think there's something i think there's something to that yeah but i mean it's a, it's a really worthwhile debate <laughs> yeah no and well this i mean so there are three questions that i came away with that i wanted to ask you immediately after finishing your book and okay. i i gave you those questions and and so now I want to ask them <laughs> of you. And the first <laughs> one is how have your thoughts changed, you know, in any way since you wrote this? Like, cause I, I mean, I, I, I'll just follow that up by saying, you know, my own experience with any, almost anything that I've written is give me, you know, three months or, you know, sometimes three days and I'll reread it and be like, what the heck was I thinking? You know, in some case, in some element of it. Like there might be a lot that I like or feel you know proud of or something like that, but then there might be other parts that just make me cringe entirely. And so I've, this is almost more of a question of like that writing process for you, but specifically, you know, related to wine. Is there anything you're? I'm sure your knowledge about wine has continued to grow and evolve, and 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 you've continued to learn more. And so I'm just wondering if if you've taken on any new information that has altered anything that you know you think based, you know, from what you said in the book? Um, There's a lot of different ways that I kind of want to answer this at the same time. Um, (laughs) Okay. I think the simplest answer is not much has changed. Um, I did release it pretty recently. So that's one thing. Um, But that's great. Great. Yeah. Not, not a lot has changed. Um, But these are not, things that I thought of while I was writing the book. These are things that I've been chewing on for, you know, since my like second year of working in the wine industry, which was a while ago. Um, Yeah. Which is really these deeper philosophical questions that you're asking me, which is like, is there something, is there something to this or is this all just an exercise in elitism? As I say in the book, Um, that's something that I remember asking myself that when I was 22 and so these are things that i've been chewing on for a while so um those things haven't changed um but i think there's there's this funny thing that happens when you take something from your brain and then you put it into 
a piece of writing and then you release it to the world where all of a sudden what was once fluid is now concrete and mm -hmm. the thoughts that you can just kind of play with are now like this is who i am this is what i think you know and there's a, a firmness in that and i i guess part of me putting this little book out into the world was wanting to push back against that idea and like my own relationship with that idea because um i think something for me that is both like an intellectual strength and a weakness at the same time is that i can see everything from multiple perspectives at the same time which means that um i can very easily talk myself out of things and that's really hard for me to like hold one firm opinion and like defend it as uh, instead i just like it, it feels like there's this plurality in my mind of like multiple things can be true at the same time and i guess i'm more interested in exploring thoughts and like developing good arguments and um really just like playing than i am with establishing one absolute truth and then like defending it with my life. So I would say that like I stand behind what I said in the book and also I could write another book that argues <laughs> the exact opposite <laughs> things and I would stand behind it probably just as much. Maybe not quite as much. Maybe not quite as much because this one is pretty close to my heart. Like I really do believe these things, but um but I don't think that me saying them and believing them negates um other things that are also true. Does that make sense? That's probably yeah. an infuriating way to answer this question. There are a lot of people out in the world who hate arguing with me because of this exactly. <laughs> I'm I'm not one of those people. I, it's a it's a beautiful answer from my perspective. I mm. feel very similar to that, and I wish yeah. more people held their ideas a little more lightly. You know, just a little less of a grasp on on these thoughts and opinions and beliefs, right. because then you can you can hold them at a distance and entertain them, turn them over. You know share them with somebody else without fear and, and have them come back a little different, you know, altered from that, inter that interaction and, and yeah, you know, maybe improved potentially, or at least different, you know? Totally. Um, and then it's, and then it's like this interaction with the world and with canons that are out there and with other people. And yeah. there's a, there's a, a, an image that I always think of with this kind of um, with these ideas and that's like the idea of cubism, you know, Picasso and the whole cubism thing. Um, a lot of what's happening in his pain, and I'm like not an art historian, so like don't, you know, this isn't gospel here, but um, but he's like representing a face from multiple sides at the same time. So you see like right. the, like an eye from, you know, face on, right? Like head on, whatever. Right. And then you see a nose that's like a profile. And then you see, you know, and there's all these different pieces and they're all from different perspectives at the same time. And, um, and it's, it's, re it, in a sense, it's, it's like almost the truest possible um, representation of that figure. But mm -hmm. by being, because it's, because it's not taking a stance and by taking a stance, by, by assuming a perspective, what you're doing is you're, is you're eliminating everything else you're limiting your view to that one perspective and in order to take a stance it you have to limit your view so um when you expand your view and see from all these different perspectives you might get actually a truer image but it comes at the cost of coherence and that right. is tough because it's right. hard to communicate um and people seem to like you know these quick, coherent, hot takes. Um, yeah. But I think often the truer, the truer answer sometimes doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's a good, good analogy. Well, I want to ask this other question <laughs> um, that I <laughs> proposed to you, because again, I, I talked about these unquestioned assumptions behind so much of what we do. And one of those big ones is the idea that wine is defined as the fermented juice of these European varieties of grapes. And yeah. what would change about your ideas or what would change about your book if that definition was expanded to be 
something more broad and more inclusive than that? I don't think, I don't think a lot has to change. Um, okay. So I would say, I would say that mostly I think that it wouldn't change um, if you brought in the definition of wine outside of um, Vitis vinifera or even grapes. Um, because most of what I am talking about is focused on um, your experience and your perception um, as opposed to the specific specifics of wine. Um, but I think that in one area it would, and that's um, talking about like these cultural benchmarks in right. like the wine industry does, it, it is kind of a canon. So there are certain wines that are like, have been elevated to some certain like, you know, status and importance. And I think, you know, some of that is like market forces, elitist, whatever. But I think some of that is very legitimate as well. And regardless, I think that a big part of um, participating in the industry is like understanding what those canons are and then or even tasting. It's um, like in a, even in our appreciation of wine, it's like understanding what those canons are and then like enjoying how a certain wine will like riff off of that. So when I taste a wine, then I can, you can already place it with like, okay, this is kind of like a new, a new natural wine, or this is um, something that's coming from this, you know, newer wine region, but it's really like mimicking the old guard style of, you know, this very traditional style of making wine or, you know, there are different things like that. So um, I think what you lose when you go outside of, um, vinifera or grapes is you lose those um those cultural benchmarks um so there is you're you're just losing one element of play of how you can of how you're perceiving and thinking about um wine in relation to the other wines that are similar to it but other than that i think i think a lot of it stands up okay okay how important is it i'm not i mean as i think about this i Nothing jumps into my head about why it's important to have those benchmarks, but maybe you could convince me otherwise. About can you say that one more time? Just about what? Oh, why? What about why it's important to have that ability to compare, whether it's with benchmarks or just with other things that you know are sort of like known quantities or known entities of a certain style or something. Like, why is it? Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure how important that is. I mean, to the yeah, you know, if I was going to propose an alternate vision for the world of wine, it would be, you know, every wine that you drink from everywhere in the planet would be different because it would grow out of that region's specific geography. And right. so therefore, like you could never, there's like, there would be no point in having a benchmark. I mean, what would be the point of that? I guess, like, be, just yeah, because, I, I like, think... then you'd start saying like your geography is better than my geography, or something like that, or vice versa. Obviously, <laughs> be like my geography is better than mm -hmm. your geography. Where it's like, is it, or is that just snobbery and marketing? Um, right. Well, I mean, I think it is. I think it's. I think you could argue that, like, you know, Cabernet tends to grow better in soil that is well drained and gravelly. That that just seems to kind of check out. Um, I think there are certain things like that that are relatively objective and that could be applied to other agricultural crops as well. Um, so I don't think it all has to be viewed in terms of elitist stuff. I think there are just some, you know, not all no, of no, it no. is like social and political. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess so. I mean, and this brings into a, a like a topic that I wanted to sort of, you know, actually get your thoughts on just because it's been on my mind and I thought we would have a fun conversation about it. But like my point is, you know, what if the only place that Cabernet grew was on the right or left bank <laughs> uh, in Bordeaux, right. like, you know, and right, because right. it really expressed that terroir perfectly and came from there or whatever, you know, is bred there and bred for those yeah. climates. Um, but when you're in Napa, you wouldn't have Cabernet because, you know, you would have something else that is ideally suited for for those climate soils everything that's there and when i say geography i don't mean like you know i'm not being specific i just mean like something that grows out of like everything that plays into and impacts agriculture farming and the creation of of a fermented beverage in 
any given area. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess that's what I mean more of that. Like, sure, like you get into this thing where you started just saying that. And I, I guess that's, I'm just trying to eliminate this vision of the world where everything is this one thing and it's just repeated and imitated around the planet. And then what is the point? And, and once you stop doing that, um, aren't you A, actually capturing terroir when you stop just trying to imitate, you know, like you just take a plant from another continent, stick it on a piece of property mm -hmm. and then try to imitate that culture from the other thing and then say like, right. oh, and I'm expressing terroir. It's like, it's kind of utter horseshit in my opinion to talk about terroir yeah. <laughs> in that way. Um, whereas I, you know, like if you, yeah, anyway, I, I'm going down a rabbit hole of asking this question, but <laughs> I hope I've made my, my question more clear. Um, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And I'm like totally down with the mission of like repatriating every grape and, but I, I think, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I'm I not know, saying you have to. I'm just like, as, you know, as an, no, like, I am, as actually. A, in an alternative world for the sake of a hypothetical yeah. answering of this question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm totally down with. Um, I mean, I, I like that mission. I think it makes a lot of sense. And um, and I think, yeah, I, I feel like they're kind of different questions. Because I think, again, we're like drawing in like a moralistic judgment of of like terroir. I mean, you know, if you want to talk about like, I would say that terroir doesn't have to be indigenous, like how Cabernet grows in a terrible climate for Cabernet is like, it's that grapes expression of that terroir. And it might be crap, but like, I think mm, like the, the, the definition of terroir, I think doesn't have to have a specific like value judgment. It doesn't mean it has to be good. You know what I mean? I think it's just like, yeah, terroir yeah. just means, yeah. terroir just means like, this is what this thing does in this place by these people at this time with all of these yeah. forces and factors in place. So I think that like, again, um, like okay. if you want to go down like a moralistic path, then like, that's a completely different conversation, but like, that's not really how I'm thinking about it. I guess I'm thinking about it more as like, this is the way things are as of now. There is Cabernet in Napa. Whether or not it should be there is a whole different conversation. But because it is there, let's talk about it, you know? <laughs> and um, and I guess like yeah. my enjoyment of like base okay, so for these like these like benchmark, you know, wines um that I was talking about before, there's like these like canons, like these like canonical like benchmark wines, like Sancerre or Cabernet or whatever, from these different places. Um, I don't think that, I don't think that just because they are there as canons, I don't think that that makes them good or bad or better or worse or anything again, moralistic like that. I think, um, instead, like, I think a big part of the wine world is like this tax, this taxonomy. And it's just like this web of, of connections and I think if you are viewing things within that, like I, my brain is very like taxonomical um, mm -hmm. and I like to look at where everything is, like where everything exists as is, and then like place things and then draw connections and label things. And I just like to do that, right? Like that's like how my brain works. I like to like understand the flow of like culture and influence and like, and it's it's all just like, understanding the system that we are currently in and why it works mechanistically the way that it does whether or not that system is good i don't know that's a whole different question <laughs> um so yeah i don't know i completely forget what the question was at this point but um the <laughs> no, answer is, is no is <laughs> no just kidding i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> um no it's great and no you're right i guess i guess i always yeah, you're just saying like terroir is just what happens, whereas I was thinking of terroir as as a pursuit, and right. That's, so that's yeah. a really interesting question. Um, but and we'll leave that there because I think that's a really you know that's a fun thing for our next conversation. <laughs> um, because I want to mm -hmm. ask you this question uh, before we run out of time that is like you know central to you know the premise of your book, which is like. 
I st- as I was reading through your book and really enjoying it and really like loving engaging with your ideas and you know questioning them and thinking about them and having them you know inspire me and also just you know uh make me question things and want to want to talk to you <laughs> and have this conversation um <laughs> the big the big one was that I was like you know maybe like pushing back a little bit on was the idea of wine as art like does that analogy hold up especially as somebody who makes wine and i i mean for me it's like i know how much of it is out of my control and that doesn't that feels different than like times when i've you know painted a painting or done a drawing or something like that like yes there you know in in art there's some element of like letting go and letting creativity flow through you but that's very different and maybe it's not very different i don't know i'm i'm seeing it as different of where like you literally are reliant on cultural logistic and um weather aspects to yeah to render the final product like the quality is not about you like you have very little control over the quality unless you are and even if you are super anal and controlling in every aspect of those things, because there are just so many uncontrollable factors in each of those elements, especially, you know, the farming and weather aspect of it. Um, so I'm, so yeah, I would just love to hear your thoughts. Like, um, you know, is it more of, is it, is it more of a craft? Is it more of a cultural product? Mm-hmm. Is it more of a food perhaps? Like, and is, I mean, I guess food can be art. I don't know. I'm just throwing ideas out there at this point, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, okay. The way that I hear that is like, can art be responsive or does art have to be solely unilater- like unidirectionally creative? Um, and I think that all art is, is responsive. Um, to varying degrees. Um, yeah, I think, hmm, I think we're, I think there are a lot of elements to what makes something art. And, um, also there's no clear definition out there for what art is. Um, so this is just kind of like my personal definition, but, um, I think that it will always incorporate some element of craft and, and then also, incorporates some element of like something a little bit deeper like something that's a little bit more than the sum of its parts and i think for me that's what separates something from like feeling like it's like it's art to feeling like it's just a product um but i think that like you know if you look at different types of art like photography is a form of art and photography is like literally just capturing a bunch of stuff that's already there so like in what like what is the element of creation in photography that's just like the lens that you're putting on it or the the you're just like telling the the viewer like well what happens when you look at it this way but it's the same thing it can just be a street corner um so i i think yeah it sounds like i don't know am i am i reading you right here it sounds like you're saying that like there's an element of wine that is just um that is just kind of like that you're just given a static you're just given an input and then like where is the creation where's the human creation in that yeah i i mean i i it's funny you brought up photography and and yeah and i I mean you brought up the definition of art which of course like if we're going to call it art or if i'm going to question whether it is art you know i should know what the definition is because like (laughs) yeah like the definition might be very inclusive and then like (laughs) my question is meaningless um the and it's funny you brought up photography because like i I mean i actually might even still have something like this on my website for my winery because i'm like i compare winemaking to that where it's like how to not alter what's there already but actually how to have a perspective on what's there that creates beauty um if that makes sense, like that, that feels like what photography's job is. If you're not like doing portraits and, you know, lighting and all that kind of stuff, you know, if you're doing like, if you're doing found footage kind of photography, um, it feels like that. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful definition of like putting a perspective on what's there. And I, um, yeah, that to me 
totally applies to wine and and other forms of art too. It feels like a balance between a human element and a natural element, um, like a human perspective on the natural things that we're given. And like, I don't know, you could like get really philosophical about this, but like I, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think about how this would apply to like, you know, other forms of writing or something like that. Um, but it's like, you're just, you're given a situation, you know, you're given like life and then you might write about it in a certain way. And that's exactly that. It's like, it's basically the equivalent of like, you're given grapes and then you choose to express them in a certain way. And I think that that is that, that same balance and that same like dance between a human perspective and a natural input, like a worldly input. And then like a kind of um, um, mental, uh, I don't know, kind of like human um, perspective that's doing something to it. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, it is. It's a, it is that weird thing. I I mean, I, I do see it that way. It's, I feel like analogies break down when, at some point in winemaking, because, you know, there's, and it, it kind of depends. Like if I owned the vineyards, the winery and, you know, the labor force, like not owned that, you know, the labor force, but like, if I, if like I had complete control over all of those things um, in terms of scheduling and growing and making and all the decisions that go along with that, like it would feel, maybe feel a little bit more like art but even to the extent that like you can't do it alone like it takes many hands to make a single bottle of wine and especially when you think about like some of these benchmark wines that we you know or whatever is considered benchmarks are being made in like the you know thousands of gallon quantities and at that level it's like how much art is actually involved in that i mean yes they're making a lot of decisions and they're sparing no expense to make those decisions and enact those things but they're like these it's, it's a mass produced you know thing um but short of even like you know being a billionaire who owns every aspect of the production there's a lot yeah that i don't i just can't control you know i can't you know i can't tell I can't, and if if you get over a size of like a, a few barrels you know you need help um at some point yeah. you know even if it's not in every point but you're going to need help at some point and once you rely on somebody to help you, whatever they're doing is out of your control. They could do something different than, yeah. than you would do it, you know? Um, and so it's this well, weird I mean, collaborative... Well, I Michelangelo didn't paint his own stuff. Interesting, right. <laughs> well, <laughs> like I mean, did he? I don't know the stuff. exact details, but like, you know, these like, yeah, I mean, these like, I don't know exactly know him or whatever, but like these old you know, benchmark, <laughs> like iconic Renaissance artists, they had a team of like slaves working for them. You know what I mean? Like this stuff yeah, is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, right. I don't exactly know the mechanics of how it works, but I do know that when I taste a wine, I taste the same personality of the winemaker is in the wine. It's true. Like it, it just checks out. You know, and I don't know if that's okay. like some woo woo stuff or if that's like how, <laughs> you know, like how the that person just makes decisions about who to hire and how to run their cellar and what kind of music to be playing. And like, you know, all of these <laughs> right. different, you know, forces. I don't know how it works, but like I I gen I can often like I, I I think that a lot of like people in wine would like would say that as well, that you can kind of like you can kind of get a vibe from from a wine and it often correlates with the same vibe that you get from that person obviously this breaks down when it comes to like huge mass market labels but um yeah i don't know i don't know man this stuff is complicated <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like i'm no expert and like you know i i've worked a few harvests but i think i i would really love to have the same conversation with with a winemaker you know with a small winemaker and like see what they think of it the winemakers that i have talked to are often just really really talk about how it's it's manual labor you know so <laughs> i don't know yeah, i don't know what <laughs> which is true also um i don't know what someone else who's closer to the product would say about it yeah 
I mean, that's that's yeah. that's my perspective. Yeah. Um, well, you, speaking of woo woo, I guess my my last question <laughs> is: you bring up magic a couple times in your book, and and I think I mean I don't know if how you mean that, and I won't make assumptions because I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. But can you sort of talk about that? Hmm. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I use some words kind of loosely. Magic is one of them. God is one of them. The divine. Like, I I think these are like the divine too. Yeah, that holder. came up. That, yeah. That's a, that's a running theme, which I, I enjoyed as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad. And I'm, you know, I'm not religious. I'm, I am firmly, I'm a firm practicing agnostic. Um, <laughs> but uh, I do find that the word God and divine are handy for some things and magic too. And I think that a lot of that for me just kind of points to qualities, um, qualities in something that feel just a little bit more ineffable. Um, yeah. I think there's this, there's this like, I'm kind of obsessed with just language in general. And part of what I find so fascinating about it is how crude of a tool it is um to yeah. express whatever it is that we're trying to express and there's this huge separation between the map and the territory you know like the grid that we are as people are like placing in our you know like ta taxonomizing brains that are we're placing this like linear firm grid onto this flowing indescribable world and it misses a lot um and I think yeah. for me, something that feels kind of maybe magical or maybe that ineffable quality that I like talk about in wine is like some, it's like when we are going from the map back to the territory, you know, because there's like, you can take grape juice and you can do a bunch of stuff to them, to it, and it can taste a certain way and you can get these different flavors out of it and da 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 da. But all of that, is still kind of like playing on this map level. But then sometimes for whatever reason, I don't know why it like makes you emotional <laughs> or like I've had wines that like, they'll, they'll like put, give butterflies in my stomach. And I'm like, I feel like I'm falling in love right now. What is that? I have no idea. Or I feel really melancholy and I've had wines that make me cry. And like, I don't, and it, it's not because it tastes like cherries. I don't know what it is, but it's something a little bit beyond. It's like something that like points back to that territory that isn't, that cannot be mapped. And, um, and I think that like being in that space, that's so much more um, fluid and ineffable that, um, that for me is, I guess, I guess that's where, I think that's how I talk about magic. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Really enjoyed yeah, talking to you. Sure. This was so much fun. <laughs> thank you. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I want to thank all of you who support this podcast through donations, Patreon subscriptions, sponsorships, or just posting a great review and telling a friend. You make this podcast possible and I'm honored and humbled and inspired by your support. If you'd like to support this podcast, you'll find links to all the ways you can support it in the show notes. Thank mm -hmm. you.